Good evening. My name is Bob Stein. I'm the interim dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies, and uh, wanted to uh, welcome you to our December headliners event. Uh, first of all, I'll apologize at least a little bit for the parking situation. Um, we have no control over that, but we did talk to the parking services here on campus and sort of pled with them to wait till after this evening to, uh, to start their work. Uh, but they have a contract and they needed to get it done. Uh, the nice thing is they're actually uh, putting solar panels out there in the parking lot. And so we'll be reducing our uh, dependence on petroleum products, so that is good. Hey, yes. <laughs> So, so I appreciate you putting up with the inconvenience. Uh, they've told us it's about a three month project. And, and so, um, yeah, I know, bummer. So, but uh, if, if you park down there in lot 108, you know the drill now on the, uh, the shuttle service. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep you informed about whether that's still in place in February or not. But uh, anyhow, that's what's going on. And uh, again, thanks to those of you who parked down there and, and made your way up here. Uh, a reminder, tonight is the final night to purchase a series pass in order to both secure your seat in here and save some money. If you get it tonight, you can still save some money for the last four that we have coming up in the spring. And if you want to do that, someone will be out at the registration desk and, and can help you with that. Uh, I have several special welcomes this evening that I'd like to extend. First of all, I think you all know we invite our PSEO students, post-secondary enrollment students. I think we have some in the audience tonight. Anybody here? May, oh, there, I see a hand go up over there. So welcome, glad you can make it tonight. Make sure you ask a question when we get to that part. Um, and also we have a special partner, partnership with a Trillium Woods Senior Living Community. And I believe you have about maybe a dozen people back in here, there they are, yes. So thank you for coming tonight. And finally, let me welcome the family and friends of tonight's speaker, glad you can make it. A um, few college updates. First, I want to uh, thank Ryan Tormer for filling in for me last month. I know you had a great conversation. I had the uh, unfortunate situation of being in England, so uh, I was not able to be here. Um, but Ryan did a great job, and, and, and thanks for working with him on that. Also, thanks to many of you for your generous contributions on Give to the Max Day for Learning Life and Headliners. Uh, this is the second year that the college got really serious about Give to the Max Day. We had a bunch of donors. We did even better than last year. Uh, we'll give you that opportunity again next year, or any time this year if you want to do that as well. <laughs> and then, uh, amazingly, the end of the fall semester is just a few weeks away. It feels like I was standing up here not that long ago talking about the beginning of the semester, and here we are at the end of the fall. Uh, last night we had a reception, uh, which we do every fall for our students who are graduating uh, or who are finishing in December. So we had about 40 out of 100 students who will be earning their uh, CCAPS majors this fall, and it was uh, just an honor to host them last night. And finally, I was hoping I'd be able to stand up here and say something really great about the Gophers' last football game, but um, <laughs> we're, we're going to talk about that in February, how great their bowl game is, okay? So now to this evening's event. And before we begin, I ask again that you uh, please, as I always do, mute your cell phones. If you're active on social media, you can follow Learning Life on Facebook and Twitter. Our hashtag is UMN Headliners. So in a May 2019 press release from the United Nations, it led with the headline, One Million Species at Risk of Extinction. It goes on to detail the findings of the global assessment of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. That's a mouthful, IPBES. It was three years in the making, and in this, this landmark intergovernmental report describes how people are destroying the natural world tens to hundreds of times faster than during the past 10 million years, raising the risk of plunging the planet into a sixth mass extinction event. Platform Chair Sir Robert Watson commented, the overwhelming evidence of the global assessment from a wide range of different fields of knowledge presents an ominous picture. The health of ecosystems on which we all and all other species depend is deteriorating more rapidly than ever. We are eroding the very foundation of our e economies, livelihoods, food security, health, and quality of life worldwide. If you want some nighttime reading, the global assessment is about 1,500 pages long. It was compiled by more than 400 scientists from 50 countries. The assessment tracks changes over the past five decades and prov provides a comprehensive picture of the relationship between economic development and its impact on the natural environment. It also offers a range of possible scenarios and hope for the coming decades. Our speaker tonight, 
Dr. Kate Brahman was a coordinating lead author of one of the report's major sections titled How Societies Benefit from Nature. According to Dr. Brahman, there are, no, there are practical ways in which we can reverse course and protect the natural environment. In a Star Tribune article back in May, she said, it's going to take some pretty big changes, but they are absolutely possible, and they can absolutely change this tra trajectory. This evening, Dr. Brauman will discuss the primary findings of the report, including how changes in nature affect human well-being. She will focus on approaches to watershed management that work with nature to improve water quality, regulate water quantity, and mitigate the impacts of flooding. Dr. Kate Brauman received her PhD from Stanford University and is currently the lead scientist for the Global Water Initiative at the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment where she also leads their impact goal to ensure safe water for all Minnesotans. Kate's research integrates hydrology and land use with economics and policy to better understand how human water use affects the environment. Through a variety of projects, she works to find sustainable solutions to pressing water issues. As mentioned previously, she is the coordinating lead author for that big long title report I told you, the Global Assessment and has testified about the report's findings to the US, U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Space, Science, and Technology. So please join me in a warm headliner's welcome for Dr. Kate Brownman. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. And I promise that what I'm going to talk about is not going to be as dire and depressing as my introduction. <laughs> but it's true. If you heard about this report when it came out, what you heard was one million species at risk of extinction. And it's pretty shocking. And in some ways, shocking is good, because shocking is what gets us into the news. And we did get into the news. People were talking about this in May. And to some extent, we're still talking about this. We're talking about it on the international stage. We're talking about it here at home. And I think that's really important because we're not going to change things unless we understand what's happening. So what is happening? What is IPBES? We actually decided that it is pronounced IPBES, not IPBES, because if you're not a native English speaker. It turns out that IP best is really hard to say. So it's pronounced it best, although I will tell you that all my Brazilian colleagues pronounce it ippy best <laughs> every time. So what is it best? It is the intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. It's actually often called a UN agency or the UN report. It's not technically a UN body, although it is organized and run following United Nations rules. That means a couple of things, but the thing that it means that I think is the most important and the most interesting is that IPBES is a political thing. It is a political process in the best possible way because it's a place where 134 member governments come together with their delegates to try to understand what's happening to the environment so that they can make changes and really think about international law and international treaties as a way to try to address this. And one of the things that they do, the major thing that IPBES does is undertake assessments. And they can undertake assessments of different things. They've done an assessment of pollination. They've done an assessment of land degradation. They did some regional assessments. But IPBES is pretty new. And the, what we just came out with, the global assessment, was the very first global assessment that IPBES has done. So how does that happen? I love that the slide that they made themselves looks like chutes and ladders. <laughs> Because yes. But what happens? Well, it starts out with this process of request and scope. And again, I think this is actually great, right? Because this means that there are governments who come together to say, this is what we want to know. This is the information that we need in order to make the decisions and move forward in the ways that we want to. In this particular case, the governments came together and they said, 
we want an assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Here's what we want in it. There's gonna be six chapters. Chapter two is going to cover nature, all of it, everywhere. And nature's contributions to people, all of them, everywhere, over the last 50 years. Go, oh wait, wait, and also drivers, the drivers that cause that, all of them, everywhere. That's just chapter two. <laughs> I was part of chapter two. <laughs> because then we get into this whole part where there's an expert evaluation, where we actually go to the literature to try to understand, well, what is the status of nature and nature's contributions to people and the drivers that affect them? And it's an assessment. We're not doing new research in this case, but really trying to collect, compile, and interpret what is broadly known across the scientific community in order for governments to take that information and understand what it means so that they can make decisions. And because IPBES is run as a UN-shaped um, organization, one of the things that's really critical about this is that the experts who are tapped to come together and do this assessment come from countries all over the world. So if you look at this picture of the, the coordinating lead authors who were at the, um, the plenary in May, there's a lot of different colors up there. There are as many women as men up there. <laughs> there are people from all around the world. There's a lot of different um, clothing choices and costumes, and I think that that is tremendous. And it makes this report better. Not just because countries are much more willing to buy into products that their own citizens have been part of, although that's certainly true, but because by bringing together the perspective of experts with different training from different places, with different biases, we actually get a much more robust finding. We tap into different kinds of literature because we're using different search terms and we're asking different questions, and we get a better product at the end of the day. Plus, you get to meet really fun people. <laughs> My team, and this is just a subset of them, who worked on the chapter focused on nature's contributions to people, was, again, incredibly diverse from all over the world. The meetings that we were able to have in person, and there were four of them, were really important because we were never actually able to get the entire group on the telephone at the same time, because it was always 3 a.m. for someone. <laughs> so what happens is that these people come together and over the course of three years, write a giant 1,500-page report. Um, you too can weigh in on what you think about this. It's actually a public process of peer review and commenting. Um, and the authors are actually required to respond to those comments as part of our editing process. And that goes on for a while until we get to the fun part at the end of the shoots and ladders where the document as a whole but primarily the summary for policymakers is actually considered and eventually hopefully accepted by the country delegates um, so that it can move forward and be used in policy making. So this is the fun part. This is the part where science and policy actually happens. And this is what it looks like. So this particular conference was held at the UNESCO facility in Paris. I was in Paris for 12 days, entirely in a windowless basement room. It was <laughs> very sexy. <laughs> um, and this is what happens. You've got experts up front on the dais talking about what's in the document and delegates from 134 countries who have been working with this document, who are airing their concerns and having debates. I got to sit at the front of the room and you can see that I'm wearing the headphones because this is a, a UN-like process where different people are speaking in different languages and you get simultaneous translation. It's a really impressive translation. Um, and you actually are editing in real time, which is as horrifying and painful as you might imagine. <laughs> and it's not just the text. We also did this with the figures. <laughs> um, 
And of course, that doesn't always work. If you imagine, as we get to the Q&A portion of this, trying to, to come to consensus in a room like this about what we want to say, sometimes that doesn't happen. So there's a lot of breaks. When we first saw the schedule, we thought, wow, there's a three-hour lunch break. Because this is what you end up doing during your three-hour lunch break, or this, doing some work in the background, really bringing the pieces together in a collaborative process among the governments where it's the role of the experts not to tell them what the document should say because it is something that's very much owned by the governments, but to ensure that what the government what the document says is factually accurate and accurately represents what's in the assessment itself. So there's this really interesting push and pull between the two pieces. And it was a long process. On the fourth and last day of negotiations, we did not end until 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> but we did, we finished. And the next morning at the full plenary, the summary for policymakers of the global assessment of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services was accepted. <laughs> it happened. And as of last week, there's like a beautiful formatted version of it. So if you don't want to read the 1500 page document, you can now download at ifbest.net the very fancy looking, uh, much shorter document of just the summary points. <laughs> so that's the process which is important because it's the reason that this matters. But what does it say? Well, it does definitely say that extinction is increasing incredibly rapidly. It's increasing incredibly rapidly for all taxa, for amphibians, mammals, birds, reptiles, fish. It doesn't really matter what you are, there's less of you than there used to be. Except humans, that's true. Although if we uh, think about the diversity of humans, there are fewer homo species than there used to be. <laughs> um, but why does this matter? I suspect that as we look at this, many of you kind of get a squidgy feeling in your belly that this is not a good thing. I know I certainly do. We, we sort of intuitively know that some of these changes in nature have some impact on our well-being. That having a good quality of life, that these changes in nature, they don't feel good, it doesn't feel right. But we don't always do a good job of quantifying or explaining why that connection happens. But that's what I spend my time doing, is really thinking about, well, why is it that changes in nature affect our quality of life? And the reason that I think about that is because I really believe that we can complete this feedback loop. That by understanding how the things we do to the planet affect us, we have a much better chance of looping that back around to change the way that we manage nature. And don't be fooled. We are managing nature, purposely or not purposely, all around the planet. Some of that purposeful management is very obvious, something that we see every day. We are cultivating fields. We are expanding our urban footprint. But we're also finding plastic microbeads in Lake Superior. And many of the natural landscapes that we think of as not being managed are actually really heavily managed. That especially when we think about places like the Amazon or even places like Minnesota. Indigenous peoples have lived in these places for a very long time, and the way that they have operated on the landscape and managed the landscape is integral to how those landscapes look now and the diversity of species that exist in them. So we know we're managing the landscape, and we know that that management is really a function of the human systems that we live in. Different people are doing different things, different cultures are acting in different ways. If we had never invented plastic, there would definitely not be plastic microbeads out there. <laughs> but what I want to focus on is this connection, 
this connection from nature to people. What we call in the IPES global assessment, nature's contributions to people. And to illustrate this, let us go to my favorite topic, which is water. So this is a very classic landscape hydrology diagram where there's, there's land and there's plants and the arrows are fluxes of water. And let me tell you, if you let me, I could spend the rest of this 45 minutes talking about that cloud water interception arrow. It is a super fun arrow. We could talk for a while about the pluses and minuses of different ways of measuring cloud interception. I have feelings about this. I have spent time with computers covered with slugs in the field. This happens. But my guess is that this is not actually the diagram that is the most exciting to most of you in the audience. And in general, that's true for a lot of what we do in science, in the lab. That we think about what these natural fluxes are, and we don't always do a great job of linking them to the things that most folks care about. The things that I care about, too. The things like, is the water clear enough and abundant enough for me to go out canoeing or fishing? Are the forests healthy? And can I go hiking? And do they look right? Can I get the timber or the non-timber forest products I need? Is the climate changing rapidly? And are there things that we can do about that by managing the landscape? Those are the pieces of this that people tend to really care about. And so we talk about nature's contributions to people not because nature is doing things for us, because those pollinators are not going and visiting the Honeycrisp apple trees for us. But we are benefiting from that. And if we lose that connection, if we forget that there are material benefits of nature to us, then we're much less likely to manage it in ways that preserve nature and preserve those benefits to us. So what are those benefits? Well, a lot of them are material. There's a lot of really good stuff that we get from the environment. Food is, is probably the most obvious one. The fish in the ocean, corn, wheat, all of these things are wild, natural things, pieces of nature that we depend on for our well-being. There are other kinds of things that fall into this category too. Your pets, your house plants. There's a lot of medicinal, medicinal drugs that are really important that come from nature. So there's all kinds of stuff that we get from the environment. But there's also things that the environment provides for us that aren't material, that aren't things that we take home or build our homes out of. Because the environment, nature really regulates the world around us. The planet is, is surprisingly good at self-regulating. Um, there's a lot of change. It happens very slowly. And what that means is that the world that we live in would be substantially less pleasant, if not unlivable at all, if we didn't have ecosystems regulating the climate air quality, the water quality and quantity, creating soils for us to grow food in, um, regulating hazards. So there's a whole universe of things that are happening and are regulated by the environment around us. The easiest way to think about this, I always find, is to think about um, if you've ever tried to start an aquarium from scratch, it's precarious, to say the least. You got to get the pH and the oxygen of the water right, or else the fish die. And then the fish poos, and you have to do something with the waste. And then all of a sudden, there's like algae all over the glass. And it just goes on and on. And in general, on Earth, that doesn't happen because we've got these functioning regulating systems. And we do need to be careful about them. And there's also this category of squidge. 
there are a lot of non-material benefits that we get from the environment. And most of us recognize those, but we don't always put a finger or a name or a quantification on them. So when we think about ourselves as Minnesotans, for example, do you think about a cabin on a lake and the way the view looks? Do you think about the boundary waters? Do you think about a farm and the way that, that the ground undulates softly? Do you think about the history of art and all of those landscape paintings and the amazing books that are so grounded in place? That's all because of nature. Nature is what's inspiring us. We're learning from it. We're creating our identities. And we're having experiences in nature. There are places we prefer to go out and canoe than other places. We like being out in nature. It's almost certainly good for our mental health, certainly good for our children's development to have access to nature. We know that there are these non-material benefits and we're only just learning how to measure a lot of them. So what does it all mean? Well, I have some bad news. Most of these contributions of nature are in decline. So this is what we did in the global assessment. So we took a list of 18 contributions of nature and worked on quantifying them, understanding what the trends are over the last 50 years in these contributions of nature. And I'm gonna start with the good news which is that we actually do a pretty good job of cultivating nature when there are specific things that we know that we want. We're really good at growing food, and we do it well. Timber, even materials. That these are things that we know we want, and we work to cultivate, and we do a great job of cultivating them. And so you can see that the arrows here are going up. We definitely know that we're doing a good job of collecting these things. But this isn't the whole story because we have to think not just about, well, what are we getting, but what's our ability to keep getting these things in the future? And when we look at the stocks of available benefits, some of these don't look as good. So it turns out that marine fisheries, for example, are declining rapidly we're still actually harvesting as much fish from the ocean as we have for about the last 20 years, which is an increase over the period before that, because we're right now successfully balancing out declines in marine and wild marine stocks with aquaculture. But this bodes really poorly for a lot of the fish species that we particularly like to eat. So the availability of things that, we, that are usually our preferences for the cost of those things and eventually for really who's gonna have access, especially when access is subsistence for some people. We're seeing decreases in the extent of forested land, so our ability to continue getting bioenergy, which is a primary source of energy for about 22% of the population, is at risk because we're deforesting and taking away those forests. And when we think about specialty products, things like those medicines, we're also seeing declines there. And that's because we're seeing declines in biodiversity as a whole, and because in most cases, when we've discovered new medicines, it's been based on tribal or indigenous knowledge of these properties. If you just go out and start randomly testing things, it's very hard to find medicinal properties. And so we really rely on that knowledge and that tight interweaving of people and nature in order to be able to access this. And as that declines, we see less and less availability of these kinds of medicinal products. Similarly for our life support systems, we're not doing too well. We're seeing these declines in pollinators, regulation of air quality and climate, of water and water quality and quantity the way that nature is able to be able to regulate these, we're just seeing consistent declines. And all of these are the things that underpin our ability to get over the long term, those material goods that we know we really want. So we're gonna have a hard time growing food 
if we're not keeping our soils in good shape. We're going to have a hard time growing food if we can't deal with our water or if hazards, natural hazards, become a bigger problem. So all of this really speaks to the long-term sustainability of people and the way we work on the planet. Similarly, we're not doing a great job with these material benefits. We're seeing declines in the diversity of life and again in the way that people are immersed in nature and therefore are able to learn from it. From, we're seeing declines in these areas of traditional natural landscapes and the stability of land use. And so we are seeing declines in the potential for nature to create more of all this amazing stuff that we love in terms of memories and ideas and art. And that's true for options also. And the options are really important. One of the things that's perhaps most important that we could think about is the genetic diversity that underlies our ability to secure our food system. So all of the crops, all of the food we eat originally started out as wild, and all of it has wild relatives. Being able to tap into that gene pool is very important as we start to face threats from different kinds of crop disease, changes in climate, changes in all kinds of other things that allow us to grow food. We need to have that wealth of diversity in order to keep our crops really producing the way we want and need them to into the future. And that's something that we're losing as we lose biodiversity. So when we zoom out and we look at all of these together, it does look pretty dire. I will admit that. <laughs> Um, but this isn't the whole story, and this is a story about the past. So there's a couple things to remember that are really important. The first one is that these global trends are not uniform. The version of this figure that's in the global assessment has this extra column that I've just added. And what this is showing us in all of the places that have those up-down arrows is that in different parts of the world we see different trends. There are places where things are getting better, as well as places where things are getting worse. Which means that it doesn't have to be like this. And even in places where those trends are uniform, there can still be change. One of the things that gives me a lot of hope in that is sometimes called bright spots. I think about this a lot when I think about regulation of natural hazards. So more and more, even though over the past 50 years, we've seen more and more destruction of things like coral reefs and mangrove forests. More and more, there's become a recognition that these ecosystems are critical for protecting coastal communities when big storm surges come, during big storms or from tsunamis. And we're seeing more and more places where people are actively trying to protect those ecosystems in order to protect the people and the infrastructure and the, so the lives and livelihoods that are in these coastal areas and really working with nature instead of working against nature. But overall, we see these declines and even if you don't have 10,000 eyes on each eyeball, <laughs> it's not that hard to see why. We know what's causing this. And actually, one of the things that the global assessment did was to, to bring together and to summarize what is known about the direct drivers of the declines in nature. So what is it that's causing these declines in nature and its contributions to people? And the biggest one is land use change. So this encompasses a lot of things. This is about when we change grasslands and forests into agriculture. It's the expansion of cities. It's the building of roads. All kinds of things that people do on the landscape have clear and market influences on nature and cause declines in nature. We actually see direct exploitation as being a really big driver. So this includes fishing and hunting um, when it's done in non-sustainable ways. Extirpation of predator animals is something that falls into this category. So we've often tried to manage Specific species, sometimes we're over harvesting specific kinds of plants. All of those things fall into this category. We know that climate change 
has been a big problem in terms of declines in nature. Right now on this graph, it's not as big a bucket as it will be in the future. And that's because as we look to the past, although we have seen climate changing to date, it has not changed as much as we expect it to change in the future. And a big part of what we expect is that all of these drivers have and will continue to interact. So if we see places, for example, where there's landscape fragmentation and then the climate changes, there may be nowhere it may be more difficult for species to move, for example. And so a lot of these drivers interact with one another. We see pollution on here. So ambient pollution, there's actually um, growing theories that some of the declines in insects as well as in pollinators are related to um, different kinds of pollutants that are ambient in the environment, um, as well as specific things like oil spills um, and toxic mines. So we see all kinds of impacts of pollution on nature. And we do see a signal from in invasive species as well as some other kinds of drivers. And of course, as I said, all of these interact together. So why are all of these things happening? Well, they're happening because we're out there part of the environment. And the actions that we take in the environment aren't all bad. In fact, many of them are good. But many of them have unintended consequences that we're not expecting or managing for. And so things can really go awry. On the plus side, there are lots of ways that we can change the activities that are negative so that they don't have to be. They can be less negative or they might even be positive. Like I was saying, we know there's a long history of indigenous people managing what we think of as pristine landscapes like the Amazon and the Congo and that in fact those landscapes are more diverse because of the way that people lived in them. So we know that there's a lot of potential. But we also know that the reason that, for the most part, we're not doing that right now is because of the bigger systems that we're undertaking these kinds of activities in. So to illustrate this, this is a picture from today's New York Times talking about the fires in the Amazon. So you might have heard about this. People have been talking about it a lot. There's been an unprecedented number of fires in the Amazon. People are very concerned about this. The Amazon is burning. And there are lots of conversations about how we're seeing the highest deforestation rate in a decade in the legal Brazilian Amazon um, that people are blaming Bolsonaro, who is the new president of Brazil, that he is encouraging this, which is almost, which is true. I mean, he has actively encouraged this. Um, and these are actually brand new numbers coming out of the Brazilian Space Agency, sort of about what this level of deforestation is. And it is the worst in a decade. But it's also important to think about what happened before this decade. So if you think back about what happened a decade ago in 2008, there was a really big thing that happened in 2008. And that was the global recession. And one of the big byproducts of the global recession is that it substantially reduced demand for the agricultural products, particularly soy and beef, that are the primary drivers of deforestation in the Amazon. So the global economy, in addition to some good laws in Brazil, but let's be honest here, the global economy was a very big driver of that dramatic decrease in deforestation in the last decade. So Certainly, there are specific things that we need to think about in terms of how we change activities, but we also need to think about a lot of these bigger picture things, what we call indirect drivers. So thinking about what's happening in the economy. What are the drivers of deforestation? Some of you may be thinking very hard about the trade war with China and the changes in soy and where soy is being sold to. Well, it turns out that where soy is getting to China from right now is Brazil. And those supply lines are going to have a really big impact on what happens in the Brazilian Amazon. And we need to think about institutions and governance because it is absolutely true that that change in governance in Brazil played a role in the increase in deforestation this year. 
not because Bolsonaro is out there lighting the fires himself, but because he runs a government that says that this is something that's okay to do. And so the institutions and governance that we have play a big role in what happens on the ground and what happens to nature. We need to think about demographics and we need to think about sociocultural expectations. It is absolutely true that there are more people on the planet than there were 50 years ago. And we need to feed those people. There is a demand for food. We also know that when we look at why the demand for food is increasing at the rate it is, it's largely not driven by changes in population. It's mostly driven in what's often called dietary affluence, which mostly means how much meat you eat. Because if you eat a subsistence, largely vegetarian diet, you actually don't have a very big footprint on the earth. But I have a really big footprint on the earth. And the more of me that there are, the more impact there is on how much food we need to grow. Which is good and bad, because it means that I can do something about it. And we need to think about conflicts and epidemics also. These can be pivotal points in changing the trajectory of how changes to nature unfold in both positive and negative ways. So what ties all of these together is that they are social values. They are institutions that we have created ourselves which means that we can change them. There are things that we can do about this. The global assessment refers to this as transformational change. And in some ways it does seem like a really big deal. It is a really big deal. But when we think about what the individual actions might be and also what the governmental actions might be, it doesn't seem quite as crazy. And one of the key levers that the global assessment talks about for making these changes is really talking about unleashing the values and actions that many of us already hold. Because if you, like me, sort of went whoa at that species extinction number, that means that it's something we care about. And it means that it's something that maybe we want to put front and center in the way we lead our lives. And part of that means embracing what the global assessment calls diverse visions of a good life. And I love this, right? Why don't we actually think about the things that are most important to us and put those forward? And that's not crazy. That's actually something that's happening right now. The population of urban Minneapolis has increased for the first time in a long time over the last couple of years as both younger people and older people move into the city center. They're living in smaller homes, but they feel like they're getting more great stuff because they're in an urban place. So maybe we need to think about really changing what's our definition of having a good life. We can think about reducing consumption and waste. Over 30% of food is wasted. Imagine what we could do. Imagine how much less we could grow if we actually ate all of that. And one thing that's really critically pushed on in this report is that we have to do this while we reduce inequalities. That it's not possible to win for us and for nature unless we think about the full range of people who are affected and how all of us as individuals and societies are going to thrive and are going to have good lives. This is not about punishing anyone. It's about raising everyone up. So there are a few more things that they suggest. They get slightly more technical and involve the word telecouplings. <laughs> but I'm going to try to put all of this together before I close up. So if we think about all of these drivers, the indirect and direct drivers, that this is what is affecting nature, we can think about all of those things in the green pyramid as leverage points. These are the things we push to change the indirect drivers and to get us to change those direct drivers. And the thing about leverage points is you need people to push on them. 
So there's lots of stuff that we can do as individuals. The report itself focuses quite a lot on things that intergovernmental organizations might think about doing because it is an intergovernmental report. Capacity building, cooperation, preemptive action. Some of that also makes sense at the federal and state level. And I will say that a lot of this is really relevant right here at home. So if we think about being out in the boundary waters or really, you know, on any lake or river, there is, I think, a real and legitimate question of what should we do to manage this? How much money should we spend? Do people really care? Is this something that should be a priority? That's a legitimate question. It turns out that the answer is yes, people do care. One of my colleagues at the Humphrey School, Bonnie Keeler, did a really amazing study showing that people are actually willing to travel further to visit clearer lakes. Interestingly, it also turns out that Minnesotans are much more picky about clear lakes than Iowans are, but that's a whole <laughs> other study. <laughs> but we can actually show that we are doing things and taking actions that demonstrate how much we value the benefits of nature. And that, when we show that, we can feed that back into that management feedback about what we want to do. And so I will end by saying I really do see a lot of hope that we're not in the best place right now, but there is a lot of room for different trajectories and a lot of those trajectories have the potential to be really positive. All of you showed up tonight to hear me talk about this. You wanted to know about Beyond Extinction. The US Congress wanted to know about Beyond Extinction. I mean, that's pretty exciting. They actually wanted to have people come in and talk about these findings so that they could start thinking about what to do about it. And in 2020, the Convention on Biological Diversity will meet and that is a treaty organization, and they will be renegotiating their targets for protecting biodiversity, and they're gonna use what's in this report as part of how to do that. And all of these are ways of moving forward and ways of making change, and they leave me with a lot of hope. So I hope that they have also left you with at least some hope, and I will end here, and I am very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Kate. It's great to get that perspective all the way from the local to the global. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Most of you have been here before. You know this is a moderated question and answer <laughs> session, so if you'll raise your hands, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, we're actually recording this. We'll uh, end up on a podcast on Radio K in the future, and so when you get a microphone, speak clearly, hold it a couple inches from your mouth, uh, and also, as always, I'll ask you to keep your questions short because we always have lots of questions. So we have one back here already. There we go, right in the middle. Hi, thank you for that talk. It gave me almost a little bit of hope. <laughs> so this is probably a really common question to hit you with. I'm sure you have an answer ready. Um, I, I respect the, the uh, suggestions for things we can do to make things better. <clears throat> Excuse me. But right now, with Bolsonaro in Brazil, <clears throat> Excuse me. and you know, here in the United States, they're trying to get water protectors declared domestic terrorists. And um, it's really hard as, as someone who's looking toward, you know, hopefully another 30 years, which isn't a huge time frame. Um, it's really hard to take anything that you're saying and put it into like a useful hope. Because when I look at the reality on the ground, it's really, it's terrifying and it's not just, it's international and it's all pieces. It's from not being able to control the neonicotinoids <clears throat> all the way to, you know, the, the genocidal 
movements in, in a the Amazon right now that Bolsonaro's thugs are doing. So I guess my question to you is, can you address that, like m maybe bridge the pragmatic, what, what I see going on in the world with your suggestions here? Because it feels like, it almost feels Pollyanna-ish. You know, and personally, just okay, well, to we'll, we'll let her answer that question, okay? okay that's, that's, okay. A big, that's a big question. <laughs> You're not wrong, um, but I I will say I think in all of those cases that the the story is more nuanced than that, and the nuanced part of the story has a lot of positive pieces to it. So Bolsonaro is now fighting those buyers because he was so internationally shamed that he felt like he had to. And while he is still blaming Leonardo DiCaprio for starting <laughs> some of the fires, um, in fact, he has mobilized the sort of Brazilian equivalent of forest firefighters to get out there and do something about this. And to me, as nasty as he seems in a lot of ways, I also see that the international public saw this happen, raised an uproar, and caused a response. I mean, that's pretty, that says a lot. And I also think it's worth thinking about the full sweep of that graph of deforestation. That it is absolutely worse right now than it has been over the last decade, but it is still at historic lows when you look at the last 50 years. That this is not, the end times, that things are bad, and we need to pay attention, because if we don't pay attention, then we don't change them, but that in fact we are making a lot of things happen. And in some ways, I even think that the water protectors have a parallel story to this, because 20 years ago, we weren't even talking about this. We were just building pipelines. <laughs> and we are talking about this right now in a very serious way, in ways that mean that it might not happen. And that, that is why I see a lot of hope. Okay, great, have one over here on the right side. Hi, you mentioned the intersection of uh, politics and science, and I'm wondering how you deal with that. Um, and I'm thinking back to 1958, 1960, when science was cool and we wanted to put a man on the moon and now science is um, being attacked and perverted and compromised uh, for economic value by coal mining companies and energy companies and perhaps agribusinesses as well. So have you run into liars and how do you um, <laughs> deal with them? Um, well, it turns out, first of all, that aerospace is still cool. NASA like never worries about getting their budget cut. People still want to go to the moon. Um, yes, we have certainly and very recently come into a different era where people, some people do like to choose their own facts. And That sucks. <laughs> That's wrong. Um, I, I sort of have two thoughts about that. One of them is, um, in some ways, I think we need, we need to think about responding to that in a way that's quite different than the um, sort of classic science way, which is like, no, I'll just tell you more facts, and then you'll believe me. And we actually have great research that shows that doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so my approach is very much the approach that I've been talking about here, which is, well, let's talk about why this matters, and let's talk about why we should care. And we've got a lot of data, but you probably don't want to see it, and if you do want to see it, Come on over, I like geeking out about this. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough when I was testifying to Congress that 
we, we had a really wonderful experience. Um, the, it turns out that the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee is legitimately interested in hearing about facts and legitimately interested in talking about different solutions and ways to move forward, but also very clear on sort of what the bottom line is. Um, there was a very different situation that happened when some of my colleagues testified for the House Natural Resources Committee, and it was theater. It was theater where people who are known climate deniers became extinction deniers. And it's quite clear that the way to respond to that isn't with numbers. And I think probably uh, we need to learn some, we need to learn something from them about how to, how to make arguments and how to tell stories in different ways, more than anything. And to stick to the facts. <laughs> Okay, here in the middle again, Anastasia. Well, I'm just going to say that science will always be cool. But, yeah. uh, I mean, obviously. I, I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, E.O. Wilson's ideas of half Earth. Uh, personally, I hate half Earth. <laughs> um, people have been part of nature forever. And kicking people out of nature is colonialist and obnoxious and it pisses me off. <laughs> if you wish to know my actual feelings about half <laughs> um, I also don't think that it's a very useful goal. Um, there are already people over more than half the Earth. And you know, what you were planning on euthanizing them? <laughs> um, I think thinking about working landscapes, thinking about working with nature, thinking about preserving the parts of nature that we care about is what we should be focusing on. And talking about kicking people out of places that they have lived for a long time is not a good way to go about doing that. Okay, great, I have one right here in front. Um, when people talk about climate change, they often talk about tipping points. Uh, around the issue of biodiversity, are there points where we lose enough species or enough keystone species where ecosystems no longer recover? And what are the implications? How much time do we have? What should our sense of urgency be? So the, the biggest and simplest answer to that is we don't know. <laughs> there's that, there's, that's like a huge we don't know. Um, it's pretty clear that there are species which, when they become extinct, we have really big problems. Um, and that ranges from the fact that actually the largest cause of accidental death in the US Northeast is hitting deer in cars because there's no predators there anymore. Um, so the fact that actually, did you know that unless, unless you're very fancy, you are all eating bananas that are genetically identical and that those bananas are very threatened um, by certain kinds of plant disease. And so when those bananas go, like it's all over. We, you, you do not get a banana with breakfast, none for you. Um, those are not obviously quite as massive of tipping points as you're talking about, but you know we have indications that these things do happen. Um, and there's been some indications in the past that ecologically they've probably happened. Um, people extirpated the very large herbivores uh, in Europe right after the Ice Age, and there seems to have been a big shift in ecological communities. Um, I. I suspect if and when that happens, we as humans will be quite unhappy about it. <laughs> and therefore, we should probably attempt to avoid it. I also suspect that in terms of nature, and probably even in terms of eventual biodiversity, it will be just fine. The sort of obvious analog being um, the meteors that caused the dinosaurs to go extinct, that really sucked for the dinosaurs. 
if you were a small mammal or an angiosperm, it was amazing. <laughs> all of the biodiversity that we actually like these days is like all because the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, but if you're a dinosaur, that really blows. <laughs> hey, great. Vivian, back here. Uh, what would you have us do personally, and what do you do personally to improve this situation? Um, great question. So I think the easiest and biggest thing that all of us can do is think about our diets, which does not mean we all have to become vegan, but thinking about eating less meat is probably the thing that we could all do that would have the biggest and fastest impact on the environment around us. There are lots of other things we can think about too. So get involved in city planning. Start thinking about zoning and keeping um, you know, urban, peri-urban spaces from expanding, um, sort of as a somewhere in between personal and political. Um, flying less having fewer kids, all of these things are things that we can think about. I think there's strong reasons that people make the choices that they make, and I am 100% not interested in telling people what they should be doing with their own lives and livelihoods, but I do think it's an important question to think about what our values are and what the implications of our actions are, and to at least try to live by those. I, um, some of you know I have a forestry background. I'll say more paper, less plastic. <laughs> more that, canvas. Oh, okay, well, more canvas, too. See, I found my water bottle. It's, it's my sense that at base, the, the biggest problem that we have is just too many people. I don't have any policy way to fix that problem, but uh, can you comment on that? So again, that's actually not at all what we see in the data that the places that have the biggest environmental impact are not the places with the most people. They're the places that are the most affluent. So when you look at where populations are rising and where populations are falling, the places where populations are rising are just not the places that have big environmental impacts. It's us. And the reason that the population of the US is growing is because of immigration. It's Denmark. It's all of these places that, where we have huge houses, where we have huge energy footprints, where we have diets that involve both eating meat and importing a lot of things from other parts of the country, from other parts of the world. Um, we see also clear correlations between um, increases in education and increases in welfare and decreases in, um, in reproduction. And so there's, there's some interesting demographic trade-offs. Uh, those are not causal necessarily, but they certainly have happened in the past. Um, but I am actually not at all willing to throw the bucket at population and population growth in general. Okay, let's see, Dave, I'm gonna come to you, right in the front here. You mentioned that uh, the largest direct driver of decline in nature is land use change. And that certainly includes decreases in the extent of forest land globally. What does your report recommend regarding increasing the amount of forest land on a global scale to address a whole array of the different issues that you raised there, certainly including improving water quality. <laughs> so, so I will say that the report very specifically does not recommend specific policies because we are not allowed. We were not allowed to do that. Um, so it's it talks about different kinds of approaches and um, a big piece of the approach is about recognizing and putting appropriate value on the benefits that things like forests provide. So what we see even in a place like the Amazon and Amazonian deforestation is that for the most part, um, pretty poor people who are looking for land to expand out into. 
my general feeling about deforestation, like my feeling about water pollution, is that people aren't doing this for kicks. They're doing it for a reason, and often what that comes down to is lives and livelihoods. And so thinking about solutions to helping people thrive in ways that aren't detrimental to the environment is a big piece of what it comes down to. Right here in the middle. Yes, there, uh, I was interested in your comment on the uh, relationship of food production. And I was wondering if you'd gotten into the impact of genetically modified organisms, uh, GMO products, because the wheat, for example, um, it seems to, it was developed to cut down disease susceptibility and all that. But the wheat from Europe seems to be more easily digested with fewer side effects because it's not GMO. And yet some of these products seem to be having an adverse effect on the human population. I've heard people talk about that. I've never actually seen any data that support it, but I've also never spent very much time looking for these kind of data. I would say that in general, we don't have studies that tell us this at this point. What we know, there's actually not very many GMO products out there. I always laugh when I see um, uh, the, the um, products that are like, GMO free, GMO free spinach. Yeah, that's because there is no GMO spinach. <laughs> um, it's mostly corn, a little bit of wheat, cotton, and papayas. Um, you're almost certainly eating GMO papayas. Most non-GMO papayas have been completely ravaged by papaya disease. Um, I have actually a lot of hope for GMO, mm -hmm. and I also think that we need to be thoughtful and careful about it. And that's about the depth of my technical knowledge on the subject. OK, back. To um, I have a comment and a question. First on the comment, when I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, they harvested shad coming into the Hudson River. And then the shad all went away. But you know what? The shad are back, um, in large part thanks to Pete Seeger and, and efforts to clean up the Hudson River. So I mean. To become a cynic and, and, and a fatalist and say well, there's nothing we can do about it, it's baloney. A lot of things we can do. The second, my question is in the Amazon, you showed high deforestation earlier and then going down and now coming back. But it's my understanding that in Amazon, that actually the nutrients are really in the plant life and the soil is cruddy. And so once you deforest it, does the forest really ever come back? Or have we lost that sort of forever or for generations? Um. Two points. First, to your first point, yes, you are exactly right. Actually, if you look at trends in air quality and water quality around the world, um, they go in quite different directions in different places. But especially in the developed world where we have things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, it's so much better than it was 50 years ago. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> It turns out that when you tell people you can't pollute and then they stop polluting, things get cleaner. <laughs> um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Um, for the Amazon, you're also absolutely right that the soils are, are not very rich soils there. And so there's, it, it actually turns out that they're really bad for growing crops on um, in general, which is part of why people keep expanding. Um, there is regeneration of forest, but secondary forest in the Amazon looks quite different than old growth forest, and it takes a very long time to come back. Um, I am not an Amazonian ecologist, but I, I would say that I would be hesitant to say it would never happen. Um, the Amazon, like all ecosystems, is in constant flux. Fires occur in the Amazon. Trees fall in the Amazon, and that's part of the process by which new vegetation grows up. And so there's, there is always some regeneration. But when you see a large swath deforested, it's going to take a long time. And it's going to take a long time before you start seeing a diverse tree canopy 
instead of um, a homogenous tree canopy that you might plant and try to grow up. Okay, over here. This is really a question about your framework in general. I, and I'm a top-down thinker, and so when I see large-scale framework kinds of things, I, I just salivate, man. They're just yeah. great. That's how I think. But most people are bottom-up thinkers. They want to look at, at little things. And the way to get a framework, which I built several of in corporate America, to, to work is when you can harness all of the people that are working up to, to have the actions that they do be in some definable category in the broad framework. So my question really is, what are you and or somebody doing to publicize this framework, not only to other countries, but right here to, to states, to counties, to cities, and, and casting it in some way that somebody who wants to start a recycling center or somebody who's worried about you know, mining in the boundary waters or whatever can see how what they're doing will fit into this framework and therefore get energized to, to go in that direction because it's not, in fact, just some little local thing that won't affect anybody else? Great question. <laughs> well, um, I, like you, I'm a, I'm a big fan of boxes and arrows. <laughs> um, I have actually spent a lot of time talking to Minnesota government agencies about this, um, and there's a lot of interest in it and really trying to kind of get the framework set so that then we can dig down into the specific actions. And part of what I think is actually really valuable about this framework is that it's fundamentally a management framework. It's fundamentally a framework about, not about like what is the deep and intrinsic value of a bumblebee. It's, well, if we have one fewer bumblebee because we killed it, how much does that affect us? And if we have 100 fewer bumblebees or 1,000 fewer bumblebees, how much does that matter? And you know, where, where, what do we want to do? Where do we want to be careful? And I think that's something that resonates very much with government agencies. So I have had the opportunity to talk about this with some of them and hope to have the opportunity to continue doing so. So one of the questions is, are they listening? Or doing anything with the information I mean, you're they, providing? They, they nod along with the talks. <laughs> so, okay, great. Anastasia, you have one over there? What, was there discussion of regenerative agriculture and in particular the rebuilding of organic mar matter and carbon in the so agricultural soils? Yes. Not as much um, at the, the actual plenary and... Um, and with the delegates themselves, largely because we were moving at warp speed. But there is a lot of discussion in the report itself and in the research that we were drawing on about agrobiodiversity and really thinking about all the benefits that it provides. Okay, Vivian has one back here in the middle. I a graph on extinctions early, uh, it showed there's always been some extinctions and it really seemed to go up about 100, 150 years ago. So is there any data to show what effect those extinctions have had, good or bad? Or is there basically, has nature just kind of picked up the slack and there's really been no effect? We, so there's data about how it's changed ecosystems. We have much, much less data about how it's affected people. And that was actually a big part of what we were working on in the report was to really try to get at um, what's sometimes called the environmentalist paradox, that we see nature declining, but on average, human well-being has definitely been improving over the last 50 years. And a lot of what this comes down to is our ability to substitute to greater or lesser extent for different things that nature provides, although often at pretty big expense, and potentially because we've made a lot of those substitutions using cheap fossil fuels, and we've also done the easy ones already. Um, so, you know, one of the, speaking of, of agriculture, you can grow plants in space. You can grow plants without soil. 
um, you know, you can do hydroponic agriculture and it works, but you gotta be really careful about it. It's very expensive. And that's certainly not how we're gonna produce enough grain for the world, even though it might be how we produce enough lettuce for the world. Um, and those are the kinds of substitutions that I think have to date caused us to not see nearly as much impact of the decline of nature as we are likely to see in the future as those substitutions get harder and more expensive. You have one here. There is a repository north of Sweden, north of uh, Norway, where they're keeping seeds and everything, even from hundreds of years ago. So if there's one type of weed grown in this country and then there's a blight or something, then they could delve into that. My question is, have we had to delve into that repository? And if so, and if so to me, that's an ominous sign. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I believe there's also a repository in Colorado as well that's doing the same thing. There's actually repositories here on campus that do much of that. Um, and, and my sense is like in wheat and some of those, they have delved into that, not because it's a disaster, but they're trying to, as you talked about before, they're sort of trying to get new genes into the pool there and combating diseases and insects and those kind of things. So. And, and we've certainly seen a resurgence in general of heirloom varietals mm -hmm. where we spent a long time breeding for um, color and hardiness. And now people are like, wait a minute, we liked those ugly things that tasted good. Uh, <laughs> and so, not quite what you're asking, but I mean, I, there's definitely interest in keeping these things up. I don't know the extent to which people have been actually using those resources. Okay, Vivian has one back here. As your assessments get out there and get discussed and plans begin to develop to deal with your assessments, are you getting pushback from people who have a vested interest, probably mostly a financial interest, in not changing things? Because it will mean that they will either make less money or sell less product, or the product they do develop will cost more. Are you getting pushbacks? Not yet, um, at least that I'm aware of. And I suspect that's partly because this is still pretty vague and big picture. And so there's not any, um, people aren't seeing a clear impact. But I will say that even during the, um, the negotiations, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that figure that had what are the drivers and one of the drivers is exploitation of, direct exploitation of species. And there were a number of country representatives who said, over-exploitation is the problem. Exploitation is very important for us. We need to be able to hunt and fish and use our forests for the material goods that our people need for tourism. We don't want to see a report that says exploitation is bad. We're happy to see a report that says over-exploitation is bad. Interestingly, this then came back to the experts who had worked on that who said, the studies that we drew on to come to these conclusions did not differentiate between exploitation versus over-exploitation. So we cannot say that this is due to over-exploitation. We can only say that this is due to exploitation in general. So we, even though, of course, we understand what you're saying, we cannot make that change in the text. And this actually went back and forth for a while. Um, until they, they sort of came to agreement and they left it in as it was. But that speaks very much to your point, that being able to, to take advantage of the benefits of nature is really important. And there will be vested interests who have been getting sort of more than their fair share of the pie, as it were, who I think will push back against some of this as, as it moves forward. Okay, one right here. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering, politics are very very uh, interesting. Colorful. Interesting. interesting. <laughs> Very oppositional, particularly at the federal level. I'm wondering if that's also true at the state level. Is it better local level or, or does the level vary? I mean, we need to have hope. And I have no hope at the federal level looking at what's going on with the EPA and 
the Clean Water Act, the former Clean Water Act. I know there are distant myths that there were cooperative politicians that would cross the aisle. Does that happen now? Did you see that when you were talking to the Minnesota legislature? Thank you. So I haven't actually personally talked very much with the Minnesota legislature. I've mostly talked to agencies, um, to, be, to be fair. <laughs> um, I think, I do think some of the sort of nasty blame rhetoric that's infected federal politics exists here. Um, but I also, in general, I think, especially when we get down to really specific issues about the values that we hold and, and why we care about things, I, I can't help but believe that when we can frame and parse these arguments in the right way, we can at least agree on an end point <laughs> that we want, even if we have wildly divergent visions of how to get there. Um, I don't think anybody wants to go swimming in a slimy lake. <laughs> That's gross. And so if we can all agree on that, then we can start having a conversation about what the appropriate steps are to think about taking to reduce nutrient pollution and how much we're willing to spend and who has to bear that burden and what we want to do about it. And I do see those conversations happening, although less and less in, in a public sphere because there has been so much politicizing. Um, and I have a lot more hope at the local level because I think there are a lot of these, these landscapes and these places that across the political spectrum, a lot of us care a lot about. Okay, good. Question over here. Thank you. Um, there's a number of elements of climate change that are either known to be or thought to be um, that have um, lag times where after that lag time passes or a threshold has passed where the climate change is driven much faster. Um, I was wondering if there is any particular research that instead of looking at the incremental changes that are going from going from here to those thresholds or those time lag endpoints to, to where the time lag dramatically increases. Um, is anyone specifically focusing from then on w under all these different elements as to how fast additional biodiversity is lost or how fast all these other things would change? A little bit. So this has a lot of similarities to this question about tipping points. Um, we remain actually not terribly good at understanding in a predictive way how ecology works. Um, and so, you know, at some level, this is just super hard to predict. Like, we just don't really know if, in terms of species extinction, um, it seems likely that there's something that sort of looks like, it's sometimes called the rivet effect, that you have a lot of, um, a lot of redundancy in terms of function in ecological systems. And Theoretically, you could have all of the same functionality with only one rivet in place, only one species that was performing that function. But in fact, sometimes there's a drought, and sometimes there's a fire, and sometimes there's a flood, and unless you have all of those species in place, then you don't get the function. And so there are, there are people who have done sort of mathematical studies that suggesting where that kind of thing happens. But in terms of what, what we know empirically, it's not that good. In terms of the drivers, so thinking about sort of the rate of forcing of that decline, people have done 
projections into the future that try to incorporate both sort of what do we think the economy is going to look like and what do we think diets are going to look like and what do we think all of these big major drivers are going to look like into the future that, that are going to cause land use change, um, that might cause pollution, that are going to include climate change. And so what are the, how is that going to affect the environment? That we see more and more of. And that's also something where um, when, we get a, when we get a long way out, it's not exactly predictive. So usually people talk about scenarios, and they always give them cute names. Well, they give them really technical names, SSP1. And then they give them really cute names like the eco garden scenario. <laughs> um, so that that does exist, but I would say none of it's very little of it is actually predictive. Um, it is more scenario driven. So okay, great. So I, I have, I'm going to have one last question for you, but uh, before we do that, just let me talk a little bit about um, what's coming up. First of all, again, thanks to all all of you being here. Um, Many of you know last year we set records for attendance at Headliners. We're well on our way to breaking that record this year, so thanks for coming. Uh, as a reminder, there is no Headliners in January, so on that really cold Thursday night, you can just stay home and enjoy that. Uh, but we do have a really fascinating talk coming up on February 6th. Our speaker, Dr. Michael uh, Georgioff, is from the Department of Pediatrics here on campus. Uh, he'll discuss what's on baby's mind the developmental origins of mental health and disease. And I've heard him in the past, and I strongly encourage you to come. It's a fascinating talk. He's talking about infants and what's going on, and they're figuring out if they can predict things like autism at a very young age. So I'd encourage you, if you have uh, family or friends with infants, you might want to invite them to that talk, because I think they'll be fascinated. So uh, please do that. Uh, remember, you can buy still a season ticket, save some money, and uh, do that. Someone's willing to help you. And before my last question, just so you don't all get up and go, the, uh, for those of you who parked down a lot in 108 and you want a bus ride back, the buses will, will be picking up out here in the U Drive, and they'll be doing that till 9.30, so you'll have plenty of time to get back. If you want to walk, you can do that as well, and we'll keep you posted about sort of the parking situation as we get to February. So here's my last question for you. You, you mentioned before about the, uh, the report is now out. There is a summary, beautiful, all that. What's next for both you and the whole group of people who are working on this report? Well, I have to say, I really hope that there's going to be a second global assessment because it's going to be so much better than this one. We spent a lot of time making those boxes and arrows and figuring out how we were going to organize things. So, man, by the time we do the second assessment, it's going to be fabulous. OK, sounds great. So please join me in thanking Dr. Brownman for being here tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she'll be around and answer additional questions. You can have them uh, drive carefully. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll see you in February.